All right, McLean Bible Church, good morning. How you doing this morning? morning. Man, it is good to be with you guys. Let's get into God's Word uh, this morning. And so I want, to, I want you to open your Bibles, go ahead and head to the Psalms. Uh, we're going to be in, in Psalm 121 this morning, on Psalm 121. And before we get there, I simply want to say uh, happy Father's Day to all the dads uh, in the room. Listen, fathers, we acknowledge you today. And yes, amen. Now here's the thing. We not only acknowledge you, um, we um, are committed to pray for you as you show up and you raise your kids in the strength that God provides. Our God gives grace for all things, including the job of being a, a great father. He's willing to give that to you. Um, but I also, I, I, I do want to acknowledge people in the room who uh, can't say Happy Father's Day with the same zeal uh, this morning. For many of you, your father isn't around or he's no longer here or your father wasn't that good or, or, or maybe you want to be a father and for some reason you uh, can't be. And I pray that you are comforted by the fact that God is a, God, God is a father to the fatherless, Amen. that he is a lover of us, that he sees us, and that he is very much with us. And so we're going to spend some time talking about this God uh, this morning. And so this week, uh, and for the next couple of weeks, we're taking a break from our series in the book of Mark. And now we're in a series titled, Now I See It. And so I'm batting lead off, but you're going to hear from many different pastors about situations that they've been in in their lives that God has brought them through. And they're able to see in hindsight that God has been at work. All along. And so I'm looking forward to preaching this sermon, Psalm 121. We're going to read it here and at all of our locations, but we're going to do it a little bit differently today. So this is what we're going to do with Psalm 121. I'm going to read the first two verses. I want you to read the rest. So I'll read the first two. I'm going to say you go, and I want you to join with me. And so you guys ready? All right. I'm, I'm nervous. All right. So let's see. Let's see if we do this. The words are on the screen. So here it is. I lift my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You go. You guys sound good. This is the word of God. Let's take a moment to pray together. Uh, Father, we sit beneath your word today with rapt attention, understanding that when your word is open, your mouth is open, you are saying something to us today, and we need to respond. As your people, help us to respond appropriately. Help us to respond in faith and obedience, saying, God, whatever you tell me to do today, I'll do it. And we love you. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. If you agree, say amen, amen. amen. Uh, NBC, listen, there's nothing uh, like a, a good road trip playlist. Listen, you need the perfect uh, playlist to serve as background music in your car to good conversation, or you need the perfect playlist when you're in your car and it's late at night and all your road trip partners have fallen asleep, they deserted you, and you need to stay awake and you need to listen to some good jams. Here's the thing. It's a fine art to curate a good and proper playlist. You know, early in the pandemic, I was on Spotify, which is a streaming music service, and I saw that somebody had put together uh, a COVID road trip playlist, pretty much saying that if COVID was a road trip, what songs would we have on our playlist? And here's some titles that I saw on that playlist. You had a song called Sicko Mode. For pop fans, you had Toxic by Britney Spears. I saw It Is The End Of The World As We Know It by R.E.M. And then you even had MC Hammer's famous song, You Can't Touch This. <laughs> and listen, and while this playlist was meant to be tongue in cheek, these song titles did not provide much in the way of hope. You see, if COVID was a playlist and that's the music that we were listening to, all those songs did was remind us of our problems and our fears. Here's my question today. Is there a playlist out there that will give us hope? 
Has anyone ever curated a playlist that can take our eyes off of our problems, off of COVID-19, off of job insecurity, off of war, off of political turmoil, or any of the specific fears that any of us are bringing here? Has anyone created a playlist as we navigate life that can lift our eyes to something bigger than our problems and our fears? And I'm here to tell you this morning that there is a playlist like that. You see, in your Bibles at the top of the Psalms, between Psalm 120 and Psalm 134, you see a description over each of those Psalms. And that description says in your Bible, a song of ascents. So to put it simply, this was, the, this was the road trip playlist for the people of Israel. Let me explain. The people of Israel would sing the song of ascents, including Psalm 121, together as they were traveling uphill to Jerusalem many of them by foot for one of three major feasts. And Jesus himself made this trip constantly, walking 90 miles each way up the, up the mountain, down the mountain, singing these psalms as he headed to Jerusalem to worship his father. You see, Jesus knew these psalms. And these psalms were literally a road trip playlist for the people of Israel. But here's the thing, it was more than background music. Because the people of God, when they were on this journey, they needed to be reminded of the character of God because the road trip wasn't always easy. You see, the hill that they had to climb to Jerusalem was dangerous and uncertain. For one, the weather was nothing to play with. The heat was scorching, it was hot, and the weather could be unpredictable as they were walking up the mountain. And also, there were people that were waiting on the mountain, waiting to take advantage of these travelers. There were many robbers who would hide out in caves or in strategic spots where they knew the travelers would come, and they would lie in wait, waiting to harm them and waiting to rob them. You see, this rope trip wasn't a cakewalk, and there were no guarantees that everyone would make it. They felt fragile and vulnerable and unsafe, so they sang this song together. And the big theme of the psalm that we're going to talk about today as we're studying God's Word, you read it and mentioned it um, six different times. Here's the theme. God is a keeper. God is a keeper to His children. Do you believe that this morning? He is. And here's the thing. Today, here's my desire. I hope that Psalm 121, I pray that this song becomes your song. Well, let me explain. I remember riding around as a kid, as a young kid with my dad. My dad used to have a 1976 Corvette, Corvette Stingray, emerald green, that thing was bad. And so I would ride in the Corvette with him. He would have me in the front seat. No, that's against the law, but that's what we did, right? And so he's driving, and then all of a sudden his old school jam would come on the radio. And so without fail, my dad would reach over, he would turn up the volume, he would nudge me, and he would say this. He would say, boy, you don't know nothing about that. That's my song. That's my song. And I immediately knew what he meant. He wasn't saying he wrote the song. He wasn't even describing the fact that he knew all the words to the song. What he was saying is that the song spoke the language of his heart. You see, what he was saying is that this song reflected the state of his, life, of his life and his heart so accurately that he could call that song my song. You see, Psalm 21 describes God as a keeper, and my prayer this morning is that you can call that song my song. That's my prayer. And here's the question we're going to answer today. How does the song of Psalm 121 become our song? How do we come to know God as our keeper? I'm glad you asked. Check out verse 1. First line of the song, what does it say? It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? I'm going to pause there because I love this. The first line of this song is all the people of God together admitting to one another that they need help. They're not holding it in. They're admitting that they need help out loud in public to one another. And here's my simple question this morning. I'm going to jump right into it. Why is it so hard for us to do that? Why is it so hard for us to admit out loud in public that we need help, that we can't do this on our own? I'm going to take you back a couple of years. I'm going to take you back to this specific date, June 7th, 2018. I don't know if you guys remember what happened that day, 
But on that day, our city was flipped upside down in jubilation. Why? Because the Washington Capitals had finally won the Stanley Cup, right? And you know this was a big deal because everybody was excited. I was excited. I don't even watch hockey, but I, I, but I was excited. Some of you guys were out in the streets uh, celebrating. I was celebrating on the couch, but it was crazy to see all the celebrations. I remember watching the news and seeing a grown man. He had to be 50. He had tears streaming out his eyes while he was jumping up and down, hugging his kid. D.C. was off the chain. But what's interesting is that same date that the streets were flooded in celebration, at the same exact time, there was something else happening an ocean away. Six hours ahead in France, it's likely that at the very same time, the streets were flooded with celebration. World-renowned tra um, traveler and chef Anthony, Anthony Bourdain was in a hotel room alone, taking his own life. And I was struck by those two pictures almost four years ago. The streets flooded with people together, unified in celebration. And then you had a man, a man six hours ahead in France, loved by many, who was dying in isolation. And this thought popped into my head, listen to this, why do we celebrate our wins so publicly and carry our burdens so privately? Amen. Why is it so hard for us to confess out loud in public that I see the road ahead and I can't make it on my own? I'm going to be honest with you, that's been the story of my life if I'm being honest with you. For the story of my life, it's always been this. I'll let you see my wins, but I can't let you see my weaknesses. I've got to be strong. <laughs> and so, I'm good became my favorite phrase. So, I'll give you an example. 14 years old, dealing with the disintegration of my family, and people coming to me and saying, hey, your dad's not around anymore. Are you, uh, well, how are you doing? And me uh, responding to them with my favorite phrase, I'm good. Me being a young adult and struggling, not just struggling, but deep in, unrepentant and hidden um, sin, it's enslaving. Eric, how's your walk with God? Here's my favorite phrase again, I'm good. Me dealing with deep and de uh, debilitating uh, grief because of the loss of loved ones. Eric, how are you carrying the grief? I'm good. This series is titled, Now I See It, and let me tell you what I see now. Because of Psalm 121 and this first line of the psalm, now I see that my refusal to admit that I need help was not a sign of fearlessness, it was a sign of foolishness. Hear me this morning, there are problems in our lives that we are ill-equipped to handle alone, and it's okay to say so. It's okay. I want to give you permission today. You have permission to be honest. You are permission to admit that the journey is hard, that the hills are high, and that you don't have what it takes to make it on your own. Hear me this morning. You come to know God as your keeper. This song becomes your song when you are willing to admit that you can't keep yourself. You can't keep yourself. Hear me today. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your destination is set. Philippians 3.20 says that your citizenship is in heaven. But hear me today, while the destination is set, that doesn't mean that the journey there isn't hard and that you couldn't use help. I lift my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? I don't know what you're looking at up the hill that you call your life. I don't know what's ahead of you that you're looking at and you're thinking, I can't make it through that on my own. Maybe you're looking at the diagnosis that you just received. Maybe you're looking at the hard situation that you're in right now, and you're saying, I can't see beyond that. Maybe you're looking at the hard relationship or the hard marriage or the hard friendship that you're in, and you just feel stuck in it. Or, or maybe it's not individual. Maybe you're looking at all the problems in the world right now. What astounds me is that with all the technological and social advances that we've made in human history, we still have not advanced beyond anger and rage and vitriol. We need help. We need help. But I love the response of verse 1. The response begins by simply publicly admitting we need help. The people of Israel declare, we're weak. 
And for us to gain the help that we need, the process begins by us simply admitting that we can't handle this on our own, that we're weak. Hear me this morning. Sometimes the strongest thing that you can do is to admit that you're weak. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Look at verse 2. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Here's the thing. Admitting your need is only the first step. Help does not come by simply admitting your need. Help comes by directing your attention to the one that can provide the help that you need. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is what I love. The people of Israel here are declaring together that we will look beyond our fears and we will look to God to help us. But here's the issue. We need help doing that. We need help looking beyond our fears and our frustrations and our pains, and we need help seeing the one who's able to help us. Here's an analogy for you. Recently, I took my kids uh, to a theme park, and it would have been nice before we got there if I knew that one of my kids would not get on anything that moved. It would have been real nice for me to know that before I paid my money. Uh, but we were waiting to head into the park, and one of my kids refuses to get on the train. That brother straights up, looked at me, and he said, Daddy, I don't want to get on that ride. This was the train that led to the park. <laughs> so here's the thing. I tried the logic first. I get down, and I say, hey, man, well, that's not a ride. Like, that's the mode of transportation that will lead us to the place with the rides. He wasn't having it. I mean, reason wasn't working. He's like three. Like, reason wasn't working. He's scared, of the, he's scared of the train. But the one thing that actually helped was me directing his gaze beyond the train. So I got down and I said, hey, son, forget the train. Look at the park ahead. Look at it. Don't you want to go there? And so that got him on the train. And then when it started moving, he got a little bit scared again. And I said, hey, son, look at the park. And then he'd look at it ahead, and then he'd calm down a little bit. You see, what my son needed was a companion on the journey with him that could direct his attention to a reality beyond his present fears. And hear me today, we need that too. We need that too. Let me explain something about this psalm. Stay with me. Many historians believe that this song was a song sung in antiphony. It was an antiphonal song. What does that mean? That's a big SAT word that pretty much means that it was a sung conversation. That's why we read it the way that we did before. So look at the first two verses. There's one speaker who's speaking in the first person. Pretty much just saying, hey, I look to the hills. Where's my help coming from? But then look at verses, uh, look at verses 2 and 3. Verse 2 was still in the first person. But then, check this out. There's a different speaker in verse 3. They're speaking in the second person in verse 3. So there's a different group singing back to the first person. That's why we read it like that. It's a sung conversation. So the first guy is singing his fears. Where's my help coming from? And the second group sings back to that first person. And what do they sing? Well, they sing about how God is a keeper. And hear me today. Here's the application for you. You need voices in your life like that. When all you can do in your life is declare your fears, because that's all you see. You need people in your life that are able to say back to you when all you can say, all you can think, all you can see is your fears. You need people in your life who are able to declare back to you, hey, remember, God's a keeper. Remember, God's a keeper. Here's the question. Where do we get those voices for us in our lives? Well, let me tell you, you get them right here. You get them in the local church. Hear me. You come to know God as your keeper. This song becomes your song when you allow his people to direct your gaze. So similar to what I was doing with my son, I got down and I spoke to him and I tried to direct his attention beyond his fears. You need people in your life like that. The local church is one of God's primary means to remind you that he keeps you. Here's the thing, I grew up not really understanding what the local church was. I thought it was a place that I simply attend, and it has no relevance to the struggles in my life, that it was a place where I needed to hide my real struggles. 
And when I thought that way, I simply remained alone in my fear and my struggles. You see, now I see it. Now I see that the local church is God's means to remind his fearful and forgetful people that he will always keep them. He will always keep them. Here's the thing. Every week, I don't know about you, every week we leave here and we go out into a world and we watch the news and we know what we do. We pick up a new set of fears. We do that. And hear me today, every time that we gather once again, it's an opportunity to hear again that it doesn't matter whatever fear we picked up during the week, it's not a fear that our God can't handle. This is what congregational singing is about. It's not about us uh, watching people who are on the stage sing. No, we all sing together psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to each other, singing with hearts thankful to God. The reason why we sing like that is because in this crowd, there are some people who who we're going to sing some things about God that they have a hard time singing in the moment. And there are going to be some people in the crowd who are very confident about the things that they sing, that, 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 that they know about God. And those people who aren't confident need to hear the voices of those who are, right? This is what congregational singing is about. We need your voice to encourage each other. This is what encouragement is about. The word encouragement literally means to put courage into. Every time we gather, there are people who are less than encouraged. They got, they're going through circumstances, and they're fearful, and they can't see their way ahead. And there are some people in the crowd who are encouraged about who God is. And we need those people to encourage the people that are weak. This is what this gathering uh, is about, that he is a God, encouraging each other, that he is a God that will keep us, that he will get us home. Guys, we need help on this journey that we call life. We need encouragers. And so hear me today, on this rope trip that we call life, what if we stopped treating each other like enemies, and what if we started treating each other as fellow travelers? If 2020 wasn't hard enough, uh, Chadwick Boseman, the actor that played Black Panther, Thurgood Marshall, Jackie Robinson, and other characters, uh, he passed away from a four-year battle with uh, colon cancer. And it was all the, months, it was all the more stunning because uh, it wasn't very many people. Almost no one knew the struggle that he was going through. I remember a while back, I was watching an interview with someone who acted in a movie that uh, Chadwick Boseman had finished right before he died. He remembers observing Chadwick Boseman on set. Between takes, he would watch as Chadwick Boseman uh, would would, would, uh, go into his his area and his wife would be holding his hand and he would be getting uh, a massage. And this actor looked at that treatment and his first thought was, man, Adam, I mean, Chadwick Boseman has gotten a little bit too big for us. All that Black Panther fame has gone uh, to his head. And then in that interview, looking back at that occasion in hindsight, his eyes welled up with tears. And he said this, he says, I now realize that they were not pampering him, they were caring for him in his last days. And there was a lot of people wondering how they might have treated him differently and thought about him differently if they knew the uphill journey that he was on. The reason why I say that, people of God, this morning is because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, all of us are on an uphill journey to this new Jerusalem this morning. All of us are looking in front of us and we see snares in front of us. And what we need is encouragement. Hear me today. Who do you need to treat differently today knowing that you are on an uphill journey with them? There are people around you, instead of needing your critique, they need your encouragement. Instead of you pointing out their flaws and their faults, they need you to point them to the God that keeps them. Who can you encourage today? If you are a follower of Jesus, know this. God has placed you in the local church for you to be an encouragement. I guarantee you, there is nobody around you who is suffering from too much encouragement. Let's be a people who gather together and encourage one another with the truth that God is the one who keeps us. But how does he keep us, and what does that mean? And this is what the rest of the psalm is about. Listen, I know what y'all are thinking. This brother is on verse 3. Is he going to get to it? I'll pick it up, I promise. Look at verse 3. It says this, He will not let your foot be moved. 
He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. See, I I love what they're doing here. You see, verse 2, they're declaring, hey, I'm looking to these hills. I'm afraid of what's in them. But here's the thing. I'm encouraging myself with the fact that I serve the God who's with me who made the hills. But then look at the rest of the psalm. I love this because they begin bringing out specific fears and showing how God is a specific help. And this is what we all need to do. Let me explain. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, let me give you background to that verse. On the hills to Jerusalem, the paths were not always secure. And so when fear popped up, they soothed themselves with the truth that God grants security. He will not let your foot be moved. Look at verse 4. On this journey, when they got tired, they had to sleep out in the open, leaving them vulnerable to robbers and thieves. When the fear of going to sleep popped up, they were accompanied by the fact that we serve a God that never sleeps. You may put your head on the pillow at night, but God never clocks out and he never nods off. You may sleep, but we serve a God who never does. Let's keep going. Verses 5 through 8, we see God as a protector. We see that God not only gives security and protection against the sun, the moon, and all evil, but he's also a companion. Look at verse 5. It says that he is the shade on your right hand. Even in thinking about that phrase, I remember when my kid first found his shadow. It was kind of funny because he didn't know, uh, he didn't know what it was, and he kept trying to get rid of it. Right? So he would run from it. He would try to shake it off. He would try to hide from it, but it was always there. And he was frustrated by that. But here's the thing. God here, he says that he is your shadow. And here's the thing. Instead of that causing you frustration this morning, it should cause your heart to leap for joy. Why? Because if you are a child of God, he is close to you. You are close to him. And guess what? You can't shake him. Your shame can't shake him. Your sin can't shake him. Your confusion can't shake him. Your fears can't shake him. You can't shake him. He's with you, and he keeps you. However, hear me today. You come to know God as your keeper. This song becomes your song when you understand how he intends to keep you. This is what I mean by that. So much of our disappointment in life stems from this fact that we believe that God has promised to keep us from things that he's never promised to keep us from. By way of illustration, I'm in my late 30s now, and so I'm officially at the age when I think that the music I grew up listening to was the golden age of music, and anybody's music that came after mine was garbage. Like, I'm officially at that age, right? And so uh, I grew up thinking that, or even right now, I think the music that I grew up with in the 90s was the best music ever created. And I'm always thinking it, what, here we go, I got an amen over here. (laughs) And I'm thinking, what happened to real music? But here's the thing. That was until I started investigating the lyrics to the songs that I grew up singing. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Like you, you grow up singing certain songs, you get older and you see the lyrics of the songs and you were like, I thought that song was innocent. What in the world, why did they let me go around at 15 singing that? Here's the issue. I misunderstood the lyrics. Hear me this morning. Many of us read Psalm 121 and we misunderstand the lyrics. Many of us sing this song and we see the line, God is our keeper, and we think that that means that God will keep us from the pain, the grief, the loss, the trials, the tears. So later on, when those things enter our lives, we think that God let us down. I know I thought that. I know I thought, God, you're my keeper. That must mean that you will keep me from the heartache of not having his da- my dad here on Father's Day. I thought, God, you're my keeper, so that means that you will keep the cancer away. You'll keep the grief away. You'll keep all the pain away. You'll keep the tears away. It didn't mean that. I misunderstood the lyrics. To know God as your keeper doesn't mean that God will keep you from all pain and all suffering. It doesn't mean that he'll keep you from all the frustration. It doesn't mean that. Here's what it means. 
It means that nothing, absolutely nothing can keep God from revealing his goodness to you even in the suffering, and nothing can stop him from getting you home. Amen. This is what that means. And I'm telling you today, now I see it. Now I see it. Dimly, but now I see it. God kept me by using my father's absence to reveal his presence in a deeper way than I would have ever realized. God kept me by using my sin and weakness to force me to lean on his church for strength. God kept me by using even death of close loved ones in my life to reveal that he's the good author of life. Hear me this morning. Bad things can't stop God from bringing to you his goodness. Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, even the bad days. But here's the thing this morning. You may, you may not be able to see right now how God is keeping you. You may not be able to look back and see your past with the clarity that I just named. It's hard. You can't articulate your struggles in the same way that I just did. Maybe you're in it right now, and you're like, it doesn't feel like you're keeping me, God. But let me tell you this morning, hold on in faith. Hold on in faith. You may not see it right now, but listen to me, all God's children will stand before him face to face soon, and we'll look back all over our lives, and each moment, we'll see every single moment, and each moment, every single moment that we see, every single one of us will be able to joyfully and honestly look back and say, God, you kept me every single step of the way. Amen. Hold on. Hold on. Here's the thing. God is our shepherd. He is with his sheep, and he will lead them home, even if it means them passing through the valley of the shadow of death. This is the gospel. Here's what I love about Psalm 121. Psalm 121, we see the people of God of the Old Testament, they are looking up at hill, uh, wondering where their help is coming. Here's the thing. Today, 2,000 years, 2, years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we look up for help, you know where we can look? We can look to another hill. We can look to Calvary. Why is that? Because we can look to a Savior who actually stood at the bottom of a hill, put a cross on his back, and he went up. He went up. We have a Savior. Remember this. We have a Savior, Jesus, who sang Psalm 121 his entire life. His entire life, this was his road trip playlist. He would walk up the hills singing these songs in glad jubilation. And I would not be surprised that this song was so heavy on his brain. I would not be surprised when, that we'll find out in heaven that Jesus was walking up the hill at Calvary singing a familiar tune. I would not be surprised if Jesus, under his breath, going through immense pain, that he was singing, I lift my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? And instead of hearing a loud response, he got no answer. And in response to that silence, we know that when he got to the top of the hill, what did he cry out? He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus got the crushing silence that we deserve so that we can enjoy the Father's presence. Amen. And why is that? Here's the reason. This is the reason why we've been, declaring, we've been declaring this whole song. The reason why that is is because our God is a keeper. He's a keeper to his children. He refused to give up on us even though we deserve that. I love this. Jesus came. He lived the perfect life that we didn't live. He died a death on the cross in our place for our sin. He rose again in power, proving that he's victorious over sin, death, and the grave, giving us an opportunity to repent of our sin, to repent of going our own way, and to trust in him as Lord, to receive eternal life, and to know that he is our keeper, that the God who was with us will get us home. This is the truth. Our God is a keeper. Will you live in response to this truth? Will this song become your song? Amen. We'll go home on this. Along with Father's Day, today uh, is a day that our country uh, is celebrating called uh, Juneteenth. And it commemorates something that happened on June 19th, 1865. I'll give you a brief history lesson and I'll give you some context. Two years before, um, June 19, 1865, Abraham Lincoln 
issues the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that all people who are enslaved are hereby free. This is great news for people throughout the country that heard the news, but there were some people who hadn't heard the news yet, including a population of enslaved people in Galveston, Texas. That was until two years later um, from the Emancipation Proclamation. On June 19, 1865, General Gordon Granger rode into Galveston, Texas. He stood in a public square and he issued this executive order. He said this. He said, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and free laborer. Here's the crazy thing about all of this. The enslaved were already declared free two years before that. However, June 19th, that declaration finally touched their lived experience, and their lives were never the same. Where am I going? Psalm 121 declares God is a keeper. Psalm 21 declares God is a keeper, but yet for too many of us, Psalm 121 is simply a song in a book, it's simply a declaration on a page, and it has not reached our lived experience yet. The Bible declares God is our keeper. And yet our souls are more shaped by our fears than by the sovereign God of heaven. And I pray that the Spirit will ride into your lives that, like Gordon Granger did into that small town in Texas, and that he will move that truth from being a declaration on a page and a song in a book to becoming a reality that touches your lived experience this morning. And I pray that your life is never the same, of you knowing that God is a keeper. Here's the thing, I pray that with Psalm 121, I pray that you are able to say these words, that this song is my song. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray this morning. Father, we know you as a keeper, that you will keep us and there will be not one of us who know you that are able to look back over our lives when we see you face to face. There's not one of us who, are, who will be able to say that there was a moment in our existence that you did not hold us fast. You are a keeper. You are a guard. You are a protector. Father, may we trust. May you give us glad confidence that knowing that even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, even when we're looking ahead and we don't know what we're doing, even when fathers in a room are looking ahead and they're thinking, I don't have what it takes in order to love my kids in the way that I need to. Help us to rely on you, the God who was able to keep us. We love you. We trust you. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I pray these things in the only way that I can, and that's the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ. And so we pray all these things in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.